This is the 27th of October 1947. The Indian forces of occupation are landing in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This is the dawn of the darkest day in the history of this beautiful Himalayan state. Today, after more than six decades, the darkness of the day continues to stretch its shadow over this paradise on earth. Kashmir is located in the heart of Asia, amongst the most populous countries of the world. China lies in the east. India touches it with a small border in the south, while the entire western border of Kashmir opens into Pakistan. Kashmir is a Muslim-dominated area and more than 80% of its population is Muslim. In the middle of the 19th century, when the British took over complete control of the subcontinent, the state of Jammu and Kashmir, along with its people, was sold by the colonial masters to a Hindu Maharaja named Gulab Singh Dogra in exchange of 7.5 million Sikha Nanang Shahi, which was equivalent to 500,000 British pounds in 1846. This was the biggest ever human sale in the history of mankind. The people of Jammu and Kashmir always resented and rejected this deal. Kashmiris launched movement against this notorious deal known as the Treaty of Amritsar. The Dogra rulers used their brute force against the people and flayed some of them alive. Despite all these brutalities, the people of Kashmir continued their struggle for freedom. This tyrannical Dogra rule lasted for over a century. During this period, Kashmiris were subjected to every kind of extortion and oppression. 1947 has special significance for the people of the subcontinent as during this year they won freedom from British colonial rule. But the future of the Kashmir was left in abeyance. On 3rd June 1947, Lord Mountbatten announced the partition plan of India. It was decided that geographically contiguous Muslim majority area were to accede to Pakistan and Hindu majority area were to go with India. Same was the formula for the princely states to join India or Pakistan according to their demographic contiguity. The Muslim rulers of Hyderabad, Junagar and Manavdar opted to join Pakistan but India forcefully occupied the three states on the pretext that the people and not the rulers should decide the fate of the states. On the contrary, India took different plea that the non-Muslim ruler of the Kashmir was competent to take the decision about the future of this 86% Muslim population. Even this plea of Indian government is weak as it is not backed by legal document. The so-called letter that the Indian government quotes in her support is itself not available. Kashmir is predominantly a Muslim state contiguous to Pakistan and succession to Pakistan was natural. In accordance with the partition plan, the people of Kashmir announced their will to join Pakistan. On July 13, 1947, in an open session of the representative of all Jammu and Kashmir Muslim Conference, a sinister conspiracy to annex Kashmir was hatched in the corridors of the power in New Delhi. The Redcliffe Award of Boundary Commission defied its own principles when it handed over two Muslim-majority districts Ferozpur and Gurdaspur to India, although it had been clearly established in 1941 census that they were Muslim majority areas and were contiguous to the frontiers of Pakistan. One has to presume that, my, that Mountbatten prevailed upon Radcliffe to change it. Uh, by what means? I don't know. He was very persuasive when he chose to be Mountbatten, and if he put it to to Radcliffe, which he might have, that you're going to cause civil war between these two dominions, or, or very se serious trouble, maybe Radcliffe would have changed it, but he should not have, because it was based on population facts which he couldn't alter, and which was supposed to be the basis of his award. So it reflects discredit on both Mountbatten and Radcliffe, this situation. Violating the principles of partition, India invaded the state of Jammu and Kashmir under the pretext of sham instrument of accession 
which it failed to produce at any international forum. India claimed that Maharaja Hari Singh signed the instrument of accession on 26th October 1947 in Jammu. Renowned historian Alistair Lamb called it as the birth of tragedy in chapter 6 of his book, Birth of a Tragedy. There would always be those Indians of legalistic bent who would argue that the state of Jammu and Kashmir was now a permanent part of the Indian Union from which no force could detach it. This emphasis was all the more unfortunate given the way in which the Indian side deliberately distorted even fabricated the facts of accession as we have seen. The Indian claim that India only intervened in Kashmir after Maharaja had acceded to India was false, as Nehru and in all probability Mountbatten too knew fully well at the time, even though they allowed it to be enshrined in formal communication to M. A. Jinnah and in the Indian White Paper of March 1948. Accession after intervention if indeed took place at all, could all too well be accession under duress and as such of dubious validity. The people of Kashmir, who were already having revolt against Dogra rule, launched their movement against Indian aggression and liberated a part of the state which is now known as Azad Jammu and Kashmir. Fearing the fall to the entire state to the freedom-loving people of Kashmir, India took the issue to the United Nations. The United Nations passed two resolutions granting the people of Jammu and Kashmir the right of self-determination. First Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru time and again reiterated that people of Jammu and Kashmir will be given an opportunity to decide their future through free and fair plebiscite under United Nations auspices. I pledge to the people of Kashmir, if you like, the people of this world that this matter could be affirmed or cancelled by the people of Kashmir according to their wishes. We do not wish to win people against their will with the help of armed force. And if the people want to part company with us, they may go their own way and we shall go ours. We want no forced marriages, no forced unions. India is playing different tricks to cheat the international community about the situation of Kashmir. She has ignored international decisions on the issue and has literally trampled United Nations resolutions. This unlawful and arbitrary occupation of the state by India has unleashed a reign of terror and oppression for the people of Kashmir, who have always stood against the despicable foreign rule. India has proved itself a terrible enemy of mankind, has no pity for children, no compassion for women, and no mercy for the elderly. Since 1989, the Indian state terrorism has taken lives of over 100,000 people, while thousands are languishing in jails. With over 40,000 disabled through inhuman torture, more than 10,000 women have been disgraced. More than 10,000 youth abducted by Indian forces and disappeared forever. Thousands of women have been widowed and at least 150,000 children have been orphaned. Kashmir issue is a highly volatile issue between India and Pakistan and has resulted in immense sufferings of Kashmiri people since 1947. This dispute has not only stood in the way of friendly relations between the two nuclear neighbors, but also is the root cause for the armed conflicts between India and Pakistan on many occasions. We are not aggressors. We are victims of aggression. It was the duty of the Security Council to pronounce on who is the aggressor and who is the aggressed. Jammu and Kashmir is not an integral part of India. It has never been an integral part of India. Jammu and Kashmir is a disputed territory between India and Pakistan. It is more a part of Pakistan than it can ever be with India with all her eloquence and with all her extravagance with words. The people of Jammu and Kashmir, sir, are part of people of Pakistan. In blood, in flesh, in life, kith and kin of ours, in culture, in geography, in history, 
in every way and in every form. We shall never abandon up, irrespective of our size, of our resources. We shall fight to the end. But we shall fight in self-defense. We shall fight for honor. Kashmir problem continues to be the core issue vitiating India-Pakistan relations. There have been many rounds of talks and confidence building measures, but the same will remain peripheral if the two countries cannot resolve the core issue of Kashmir. The very resolve on the part of India and Pakistan to directly address the Kashmir problem would be the act of supreme confidence building for the sake of peace and prosperity for all of South Asia. Problems are not resolved by running away from them. On the way to permanent resolution of the Kashmir problem, the first step must be halting the bloodshed and tyranny that rages in Kashmir as right to life and honor takes precedence over every other right. Pakistan and Kashmiris demand nothing but the implementation of United Nations resolutions on Kashmir. And it is possible only if India stops state terrorism in Kashmir and withdraws its 750,000 strong army from occupied Jammu and Kashmir. In the modern world, where democracy and peace are the ultimate objectives, Kashmiris are very much sure that very soon the darkness of the 27th October 1947 will be over and peace and tranquility will return to Kashmir and they will get their inherent right of self-will.